really sorry. I don't know what's going on that. That's good. There was like this truck trying to turn on the way over here. I think some of you were there and thought it was uh, quite humorous and delayed us slightly. <laughs> covered essentially all of networking up until TCP. So we did IP, we did Ethernet, IP, UDP, and now TCP. So there's actually some interesting stuff in here that will hopefully clarify some things. Some people have questions in office hours today about uh, what happened or why when I sent data over a TCP connection, how come I didn't see that in the packets that were getting sent with my reflector? And so this will help answer some of those questions. Um, so at a very high level, we talked about TCP. So what does TCP guarantee for us? Reliability. Reliability. What else? What was that? Integrity. Integrity. It's going to go in order. In order. So our packets will be delivered in the order that we sent. What's the other big difference from UDP? Well, that oh connection, yeah. So we have a connection and stream oriented, right? So we can just send data. We don't have to think about just sending individual packets. We're sending a bunch of data. Um, so the idea is to recap. I think this is right where I left off. So we have. A server is listening on a specific port, right? And just like in any kind of networking, in order to connect to that service, you need to know what is the IP address of that machine and what is the port of that machine. And then you can connect to it. So then the client initiates a connection. So to do that, the client sends a SYN packet with a random initial sequence number, SC. Then when the server gets that, if the server is listening, it answers with a SYN ACK packet, which has the server's random sequence number, SS, and SC plus 1 as the acknowledgement number of this packet. Remember, this is a way for the server to say, yes, I hear you. This is the next byte, I, the next packet I am expecting from you. Finally, if everything goes good and the client wants to set everything up, the client sends a packet back with the act flag set, the acknowledgement number of the server sequence number plus one, and with their sequence number of SC plus one. So now we've actually established a three-way handshake between these two nodes. So what do we, and at this point now, data can flow. So, the question is, well, what do we choose as an initial sequence number? Right? Yeah? Why? Why do we want to choose a random one? Well, let's we'll think about this. So there's a, the standard for TCP says that we should increment a sequence number every four microseconds. Um, and other systems have done other things. So we'll look at this and we'll kind of just leave this here because I want you to think about, okay, well, why does it matter so much what this initial sequence number is? And we'll see how this can play out in practice. So this is the famous TCP three-way handshake. This is another thing to learn deep inside your bones so that if you ever get asked this by somebody, you know exactly what they're talking about with the TCP handshake. So first, the client sends a packet to the server. So the destination port, so those are the TCP headers of, the, of this packet. So the destination port is port 22. What's port 22? SSH. So this looks like the start of an SSH connection. So the server is trying to SSH into the client. What's this number? ID? No ID. The source port. So this is the source port. Why is the source port important? Yeah, the server has to reply. In order to reply, we need IP address and port number. Right? So this tells the server how to reply back. 
So essentially the client determines a random port on their machine that is free and not being used by anyone. And so they say, okay, I'm gonna use this port to get the reply from the server. So I'm sending to port 22, the reply port is 13987. I've chosen a random sequence number of whatever 6574, and the SIN flag is set. So the SIN flag is one. So the server gets this, what does it wanna do? So it's gonna reply, what is it gonna do? What's the destination port of that packet? 13987 is gonna be the destination. The source is gonna be what? 22, exactly. What's the acknowledgement number? One. 6575, so it will be the sequence number sent from the client incremented by one. And the sequence number that the server sends will be some random number. And the sin flag will be set and the act flag will be set. So sin, sin act. So here the sequence number is 7611. Yeah, we're good. And then the client responds with source port 13987, destination port 22, sequence number of 6575, and act of 7612 with the act flag set. So now once the server receives this packet, now both sides know that they can send information to each other and everything will go fine. Questions on query and handshake? Cool. So, we, if we look at this and we TCP dump this conversation and snip all the packets that are getting sent, the first thing we have is an ARC request. What's an ARC request? I feel like you know it a lot better now, or maybe you will in a week. <laughs> right? So, that 20, which was the client, let's say, says, hey, who has that, who has that 10? It replies, hey, that, or who has that 20, tell that 10, hey, that 20 is at this Ethernet address. And then we can see a, now this is a slightly different SSH connection from 1026 to 22. And here we have the SIN, so this S means the SIN flag is set. It has a random sequence number here of 10.15.043. We get a reply back with the SIN flag also set and the ACK flag set. So the ACK is this number incremented by one. The SIN is some random sequence number. And then finally the client responds and acknowledges. So this dot means there is no SIN flag set. So the acknowledgement flag is set with this one, 405, uh, 6577944. So now that we've established this connection, now we actually want to send the data. And remember, this is uh, so. This is a little bit tricky, right? Because we have to, unlike UDP, where we can just send packets without thinking, right? Here we actually need to make sure we're sending packets in the right order, or that when a packet has been lost, we can retransmit it, and the other side can ask us for packets. So we need to look at how exactly this happens. So. The idea is every time one side receives data from the other, they send an acknowledgement back to the other side with the next sequence number that they're expecting. Right? So a packet comes in, it's gonna have a sequence number. The packet carries whatever, 20 bytes, 100 bytes, some amount of bytes, and then the side will respond with an, an act packet that says, the sequence number plus the size of the packet, which is let's say 101. So it'll say that's the next byte I'm expecting. Uh, cool, yeah. So, uh, transmission window. So this is how it acknowledges when it's being sent. So it just sends an empty packet with no bytes as an acknowledgement packet. Uh, other thing I guess to point out with the three-way handshake, how much data is in the size of these packets. These are TCP packets, these are the headers, what about the body or the data of the packet? Nothing, doesn't make sense to send anything, right? We haven't even established that we can properly talk to each other, so why send any data, right? So that's another thing 
these packets are sending no data, but they are sending basically a TCP frame or a TCP address. Okay. So we can look at what happens with some kind of data exchange here. So we can have the client send to the server. So this is an ACK packet that says, hey, continuing off of where we were, this is sequence uh, 6575 and acknowledgement. I'm expecting 7612. That's where I'm expecting from. And oh, and if I'm sending 25 bytes, <laughs> that means what should the server acknowledge? It'd be 6575, which is uh, 6601, right? Because it's acknowledge the next byte. So we got those 25 bytes, and we're expecting the next byte. So it should. Okay, the sequence number here is 7612. And then 
this side can then say, okay, I'm going to send you a fin packet, so now we're actually stopped. Communication done, TCP connection closed. And this will side will acknowledge that, and after this point, after this point, if the client makes a new connection to his server, that would be a brand new TCP connection. Questions on shutdown? Yes. Um, how would the diagram change if the server closes a connection un unexpectedly? Uh, in, in what way? Um, like, maybe someone went in there and said shut down mm. or restart. So, a couple different things. So A, if the server just goes down, the client will keep trying to send packets and say, hey, where are you? It'll realize it's not getting any acknowledgments for anything that it's sending, and so it will time out at a certain point and just say, okay, this connection's dead. Okay. Another thing that can happen is, let's say the, uh, the application that was running and talking just gets killed without any cleanup. Um, at that point, I believe the, there's a reset flag, an RST flag, which the client would send a packet to the server, the server would say, there's nobody here to listen to this. It would send a reset packet, which says, hey, something went horribly wrong, which is what happened, so you have to restart this connection. Then the client would probably try to reinitiate the connection, and then the server would not send a synac back, because there's no server listening there. Okay. So yeah, it kind of depends exactly on the mode of failure, uh, what happens, but yeah, they will stop talks. Eventually, they'll stop talking. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, um, how do we get stop like the acknowledgments? Here, after this one. So you send one fin and then one acknowledgement. Or you send a fin, the other side will acknowledge that. And then they'll send a fin. You'll acknowledge that, and then that's it. No more. Does, does the, uh, yes. when you go through the DNS, like the uh, what, when you're trying to find where the server is located, that, that all happens before the sprite, so that's yes. that goes because there. Yes, IP addresses, remember? So these are just the TCP headers of the packet, right? But enclosing that is IP headers, and then enclosing that are Ethernet frames for each step of the hop. So, so yes, to get even the IP address of the server that you want to talk to, you have to do a DNS query to resolve that domain name to an IP address before you even start this connection. So that's why your IP and your DNS server has to be an IP address. <coughs> and it can't be a DNS address because then you just try to, you never finish resolving, right? Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, and you can look at this. I actually highly recommend you do this. You're probably hopefully already doing this for your um, project for part two. Very handy to use Wireshark on both machines, your attacker machine and the machine you're running the reflector on. Um, but even it's just fun to pull it open and see kind of what's going on in the traffic. Okay, so just like UDP, right? So with UDP, we had a way to maybe try to tell which servers, uh, which ports were open on a given machine, right? So we have an IP address, we want to know what network services are running there because maybe we can attempt to try to exploit that, right? We want to know, is this machine, is it running SSH? Is it running a printing service? Maybe it's a printer. Is it running any kind of other services that could be interesting? And so, so how did we try to determine UDP ports being open? Yeah, so you send a packet to all the port numbers, and what were you hoping for back? Yes, the ICMP port not available error. Yeah. So, with TCP, we actually have a lot of different ways to try to port scan. For UDP, there's kind of really only one way. For TCP, we can do a couple different things. Um, and we really want to do this in order to determine which TCP services are running on the host, right? Remember, as attackers, the more information we have, the better, right? So if we can know exactly what services are running on that machine, that would be really good for us. So, like we said for UDP, 
The services that are running on each port are statically, you know, usually statically determined, although that's not always 100% of the case. You can check out the file EPC services on any Unix distribution. It will tell you all the mappings there. So the basic TCP port scanning is super easy. You just take that IP address, you try, it's called connect scanning. So you just try to do a handshake to every single port on that server. And if you get what, when are you successful? Yeah, so if you complete that three-way handshake, you know you're good and you can talk to that server, right? So you just try to open a TCP connection to all of the ports on the victim host. And this is really, well, one of the ways that why this is really good, so hey, so if you know that the handshake was successful, then you, that port is open. So what are the benefits here? Send malicious data, not just ask if they're there. Uh, but we don't want to send anything malicious yet. We just want to see who's there. Yeah. It doesn't really look malicious if you're just sending a couple every now and then because it's just a connection. Yeah, so if, well, if you spread it out enough, then yeah, maybe it's not that noticeable because you're you're actually trying a real connection, right? You're not sending any weird packets there. You're just trying to connect like a normal person. The fact that you're trying to connect to port one is maybe a little weird. What else? How does your browser connect to websites? HTTP using what? TCP, right? So you're doing in part three. Right. Do you run your browsers as root or as the administrator? No. no. So essentially, they're doing this connect, right? So do you have to be root to run a connect? No, you can be any user, right? You're just making a normal connection to the server. So one of the main benefits here is you don't need to be root. Um, so if you don't spread this out over time, what? would be some of the downsides then. It's going to be a lot of network traffic. <clears throat> yeah, how many? 65,000 times like two. Times two or three, depending. Yeah, that's a lot of traffic, right? This is, may, we may be sending a ton of traffic to this machine, so, you know, we're not being very stealthy. So the way to be stealthy, you either send less or you spread out the amount you're sending over time. Right? Uh, those are kind of the main techniques. So connect scan is super easy. Uh, you can use Nmap to do this. This is running a group, but you don't need to. This is actually another good way to test your reflector. If you try using Nmap to scan the victim IP, it will be like this. It should have the exact same results as if you scan the attacker's IP. Although the tricky thing, uh, tricky thing there is if you're running it. From, if you're trying to scan the same machine, some ports may be open and listening only for local hosts. So they would be accessible from the victim's machine, but not from the reflector. Uh, anyways, this should still work is kind of the important thing. It should see you relevant stuff. Uh, so here, this machine has a lot of different ports open. Uh, FTP, SSH, the Echo service, which I'm going to be running anymore. Um, Login shell, it's running X11, an X11 server, which is not very, probably not very safe. Uh, and you can run this, and it runs actually pretty quickly. Um, so what would be maybe another way that we could try port scanning without doing the sin, sin, act, act? What do we need from our technique? Let's think a little bit meta. Like, what do we need from a port scanning technique? What's our goal? Get to find out if a vulnerable service is running on a specific port. Yeah, or find out if a port is, oh, if there's a service running on that port, right? We don't ever know that actually this service is running yet. We have to do more digging. But we just want to know if the service is running on this port. Just a second. Think about high level, right? So that's what we want to know. So what, what must our technique be able to do? Get a replacement port. What was that? 
Get a replacement? I can't see who's talking. Get a replacement from the board. Yeah, so we want to, well, maybe get a reply or maybe not, right? So in the case of UDP, we wanted an ICMP message, but we need a way for what we send, we get a response back if it's open or not, right? And that's what we want to know. So what would be, so what would be some ways maybe that we could do that? Based on what we've seen so far. Maybe use UDP, ICMP, and see which, which is open and then do TCP on the ones that are open. Hmm, that's interesting. So scan UDP, usually they won't be on the same ports. Uh, so you'd have to scan it all again anyways, but it could give you a good starting point. Maybe, I don't know, DNS has a mode where you can run it in TCP or UDP, although it's almost all UDP. Huh. I don't know if it's the same port. Yeah? So like an app packet or something, like assume that a connection's already open and see what they say. And see what hmm. So yeah, you could um, maybe just try to, so thinking about the different protocols, right, and thinking about, okay, what happens if I do something weird? Right? Does the other side change its behavior based on whether that port is open or not? Uh, yeah, that's actually, I think, similar to one technique we'll look at. So the three-way handshake requires us to send how many packets? It's a trick question. It requires us to send how many packets? Two. Two, right? And we get one back. Do we need to send all three? Or do we need to send all two? Yeah, just send the first one, see if we get a SYNAC back, and then don't reply, right? And don't keep that connection open. So this is called SYN scanning, or it's also half open scanning. So it's a very simple idea. We send a SYN packet. If the port's open, the server will send what back? SYNAC. If it's not open, it will usually send a reset packet. Usually, not always. So instead of sending the final act, we can send, well, we can either do nothing or it, we can send a reset packet. Um, there's various, so if we send a reset packet, we're not actually gain, gaining a lot of uh, network stealthiness. But, so when we do a full three-way handshake connection, right, to a port, who finds out about that? So who's handling the handshake? The client's what? <laughs> Kernel. The, the client's oh, operating system is handling this handshake. <laughs> then when it finishes that handshake, then what happens? Who gets notified? The application. The application that's listening, right? You're writing a web server in, T, in uh, C, right? You call listen on a socket, and you get notified whenever a new connection happens, right? And that is after the three-way handshake. So the one downside of doing just connect scanning is the applications know that somebody tried to connect to them, right? So the benefit here is we never made that three-way handshake, right? So the connection is never open and fully open, and this is usually not logged by the operating system or the application itself. So there's no record on that system that we ever made these connections. Is that it? Send the RST or if you don't send the RST? I think both ways. Okay. Sending the RST would you know, definitely say something went wrong and they'll both stop sending stuff. Uh, not sending anything at some point, it will time out um, and it will not. Although, well, that also looks like another attack that we'll talk about later, a DOS attack. So you may <coughs> not want to do that. Yeah. Could you add like any like security measure to the, the kernel to like log? Yes, you definitely could. Um, but yeah, it requires changing things and adding things, right? So you do that, and then I find out about it, and so I'll come up with a different way that you're not logging or not scanning, or I'll use one of these other techniques. Yeah. Just to clarify, the reset packet, that won't uh, cause the server to somehow start trying to do the handshake itself, or? No, no, no. Reset, reset means the protocol messed up or something okay. weird happened, so 
Yeah. So it's like the client's responsibility to try and do a handshake again? Yes, if the client wanted to talk again, you would have to redo that, exactly. And that would be, I think, either way. Yeah, you, otherwise, you can do a lot of weird yeah. stuff if you can force the server to make connections. Cool, so you can use this. There's an, another option in EdMap. Remember, we're teaching you how to build tools, not use them. Uh, but using them is fun to learn how they work. So you can pass this option. This has to be done as root. Why? Yeah, you have to have access, just like you're doing in Scappy, right? You have to have physical access to send out <coughs> arbitrary packets, right? By doing that, you're essentially bypassing the kernel's TCP stack and saying, I want to do this on my own and send out my own packets. So you run this here, and it will say, uh, on this machine, that port 80 was open. Um, and if you look at the TCP dump, you'll see a bunch of SYN packets, right, to port 78. 78, I don't know why I said it twice, but maybe it does that. 81, 82, 80, 79, and we will get a, uh, a reset packet from port 78, so that's from the server, right? So saying, hey, there's nobody on this port. On port 81, we'll also get that until we get to port 80 where we get a synact packet back. But at this point, we then will reply with our own reset packet to say, okay, don't actually fully establish this connection. <laughs> cool. There's other things. So just like we said earlier, what if we send weird, you know, different things? So what if we just send a fin packet to a certain port if we've never talked to that port or don't have a connection established. So just send it with a fin mark packet. So again, this depends on differences in the actual implementation. I'm fairly certain there's nothing in the specification that says, if you get a fin packet, do this, right? And you're not receiving anything. Um, and so it's up to the implementation to decide how they actually implement these things. So in most of these, if the port's closed, you get a reset packet from the kernel. If the port's open, then the thin packet is completely ignored, right? And so by using this behavior from the outside, you can make a much stealthier scan of the system, right? So here, because how many packets are you sending out for each port? One, just one, right? And you're in this case, you're, you'll get a reset back for all the ports that are not open. So, what's the downside of using a technique like this? There's no difference between an open port and a port that's not uh, being used at all. It's, it's just gonna ignore it. A port that's not being used at all, what's that? Like, if, it, if they don't send the RST packet back, like, Yes, so one thing could be maybe they're dropping these reset packets. Maybe there's a firewall in the way that's dropping it, which would make every packet look open, right? The fact, so if you can get a response back and you can see two different responses, then you'll know for certain which way it is, right? But getting, not getting a packet back is kind of not an easy signal to go off of, yeah. If you keep getting timed out, right? Won't it seem like you're trying to do a DDoS if all the ports are open, and then you keep getting time off because they're all open, and, they, and then it makes it seem like you're actually trying to, you know, deny service. But it's a timeout on our side, basically. So the scanner, the port scanner, is going to send fin packets, and for each packet it sends, it says, okay, wait two seconds or whatever the tool's configured as. If I don't get a response by then, then I assume it's open, right? And the problem is that assuming, because you may, Anything could have happened. Maybe the packet just got dropped on the floor. Yeah. Different kernels could have different responses to the packet. Yeah, right? What if, is this the behavior in every single kernel? Maybe it's different on the iPhone than it is on a Linux system, right? And that actually is part of the problem. So on Windows, a reset packet is always sent back, no matter if it's open or not. And so if you try to use this on a machine that you don't know the operating system of, right, you may get inconsistent results. But you may know the operating system, right? How many you know? You could do like the operating system. 
them fingerprinting or whatever? So yeah, so I talked about operating system. Uh, Nmap has a way to do operating system fingerprinting. You can do that. You may just know. So if you look in HTTP headers you, that are being sent back, oftentimes they'll say what operating system is running. So they'll say the exact PHP version sometimes and operating system that's running. So you can use that information in ways like this to improve your attack. Or you may just know, like there's certain companies that all their servers run Windows or all their servers run Linux, right? And so you may know through another way. So you can do all kinds of weird, there's all kinds of techniques. There's what they call the Christmas tree scanning, which is you turn on like all the flags. So you turn on thin, push, urgent, and that causes different behaviors and responses. To be honest, I don't remember exactly what the various response is, but it's a similar idea, right? You'll get different responses based on if the port was open or not. Similarly to the, so that Christmas tree, you can think of like all the lights on on the packet. The opposite of that would be what? All the lights on. All the lights off. Turn all the flags to null. No flag set, so that's a null packet. So you can do all of these again with Wireshark. So Wireshark will do all of these. So you can do thin scanning of a system, uh, and you can look at it, and it just sends a bunch of thin packets, and we get reset packets back for 79, 82, 81, 78, but we do not get a thin packet back for 80, which means that that port is open on this machine. Consistency is part of it. You're actively sending packets on the network. We are actively sending packets on the network with what source IP? Ours. Can we spoof the source IP? No. Sure. Yeah, somebody wants the packets back. You can like snip at that or something. Yeah, if we, so, if we spoof the source IP, we won't get the packets back to <laughs> us, right, fundamentally. So this is, um, an important thing to think about, right? If in TCP, right, with, or any kind of thing on IP, as we talked about, if we ever want to get a response back, we have to send it with our source IP address, right? So the key problem is, if the defender is look, watching their network, right, they'll see port scans coming from us, from our IP address. Question. Couldn't you just combine that with sniffing and send uh, fake uh, source? Um, IPs and then listen for who's sending stuff back to that. So who could you, who, what IPs could you spoof in that case? Could you spoof an arbitrary IP address? Yeah, so you can only spoof somebody who's on your subnet and to do that you would have to maybe implement ARP, what you're doing. Um, but the downside there is they'd still know what autonomous <coughs> system you're coming from, right? They would still, the IP address would still have all that information about your subnet in it as well. And especially on networks like this where we have, uh, most people are behind NATs, right? So our IP address we have inside here in ASU is an internal IP address, right? You can't ac access that IP address from outside. So in that case, you're not really gaining much except uh, maybe pretending to be somebody else on the network. Uh, but yes, you could do that, but how much that gets you, that's part of it. You, know, you can't just you know, choose any arbitrary address. So there's a, a, an incredibly cool technique that we're gonna look at that actually allows us to use a third-party machine to port scan another, uh, our victim that we wanna get which is really cool. Um, Could you use the DNS service? Huh? Could you maybe use the DNS service? Uh, to do what? Port scan? I don't know. Port scan? Uh, no. Well, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so this is called idle scanning because you need this cohort server that you're going to actually trick to scan needs to not have a lot of traffic, and we'll see why. 
the idea is that we're going to find some relay, or that we're, sorry, we're going to relay our scan through a victim. So we're going to try to port scan one machine, and we're going to relay our traffic through this victim, and they're going to scan on behalf of us, but we'll still be able to see the results of that scan. So the idea is, so what do we have to do if we want to send packets? Like in, at a high level, if we want it to not come from our source IP, what do we need? Yeah, so we need root access to the physical device. What do we need to have the desk, the source IP be? Something on our system or on the disk. Just a second, yeah. The yeah. Uh, yeah, so we need, so essentially it can't be our IP. That's the whole point, right? It can't be our IP address. We need to be somebody else's IP address. And so that's, you know, at a high level, we want to spoof our IP address. That's what we're going to have to do. So what we're going to do is we will send out a packet on the network with, to, the, to the target. So this is the machine that we are trying to scan. We're going to send out a packet to the target with the source IP of the victim. So you're the target, you get this, I, this packet, so what happens then? Send the SYNAC back to the... Yeah, so assuming it's a SYN packet, right? We didn't specify exactly what kind of packet, so it depends, right? So depending on what type of scanning, if we send a SYN packet, it will send a SYN packet, SYNAC packet back to the victim. If we send a a fin packet or a reset packet like we saw, then depending on the operating system, it may send a reset packet back to the to the victim or it may not, right, depending. <coughs> so the, the target gets this, it looks like it comes from the victim. The target will then reply to the victim. So if the target replied with a SYNAC, right, as we just said, so we sent a SYN packet. If the target replied with a SYNAC, which means it's an open port, then the victim will send out a reset packet. What happens if the port is closed? What will the attacker send? What will the victim send? The target. Sorry, there's three machines here. I know I'm changing the terminology. I'm confused too. So the target, we're targeting, trying to scan this machine. So we send a SYN packet to a port there with the source IP of the victim. The port is not open. What does it send? Reset or nothing. A reset. So let's go with reset. So it sends a reset packet back to the victim. And what does the victim do when it receives a reset packet? Ignores it. Drops it, doesn't do anything with it. So here we have two different behaviors, right? So in one case, if the port is open, then we know that the victim sent out a packet. If the port is closed, then we know that, or if the port is closed, then we know that the victim did not send out a packet. And it turns out with just that one bit of information, that's enough for us to understand and do a port scan here. So the idea is the attacker, before we do this, we're first going to try to probe the victim, which is where we're saying all these source IPs come from, and we try to say what was the IP datagram ID of that packet that we first got. Then we do this. Then we try to ping them again to see what's the IP datagram ID. Right? This is, in most OS, this is a sequentially increasing number. So we know that if this doesn't get incremented, then the port is closed. If it does get incremented, then the port is open. So look at this 
So basically, it boils down to, okay, let's get a baseline to try to find out the initial IP sequence number. So we have our relay, we have our victim, we have our attacker, right? So we first send out a packet to the relay that says, hey, whatever, Synac, it doesn't matter what type of packet we send, as long as we get a response back. We get a response back, that will have an ID in the IP field, which will be whatever, 11, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then in the next step, we want to now do our port scanning. So now we send our spoof packet to the target from the victim's IP, right? And the key thing is, remember, we can always do this on the network, but we can't always get the reply. So we'll do a reset packet to port 80, or, no, 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 a SIM packet, sorry, I got the wrong thing. So port 80 is open, they'll send a SIN act back to the relay. The relay says, what are you doing? I'm not talking to you, go away. It will send a reset packet back. And the key is here, this ID is 1235, of this packet that I just sent. And so we send another packet to the relay, saying whatever. We get a reset packet back with 1236. So now we know that that packet was open, that that one sent it out. So why is this called an idle scanning attack? Yeah? Because the, you're, you're hoping that the relay doesn't have any traffic that's incriminating. Yeah, if there's any other traffic to this relay, or the victim in this, or the, oh, it is called relay. Uh, if there's any other traffic to this relay, it's going to mess up our count, right? And we're not going to get the right count. Is that hand in the back? Okay. Right? And we've got to think about the other case, right? So that's the case that the port is open. If the port's closed, we'll send a SIM packet, we'll get a reset packet, the relay won't send anything back, and we'll send the packet and we'll get 1135 to see that it didn't get incremented. And so this would tell us that that port is closed. So we can do this for every single port on the system, right? And so all the packets that the victim sees, who do they come from? The relayer. It's pretty cool, right? This actually works. Yeah. How often would the system be idle, though? It seems like everyone's always sending connections. And Ooh. Uh, everyone's always sending connections. So another way to think about it is, you know, you don't, if it's completely silent, then you can always do this 100%, right? But if, let's say, you can identify, mean, you could choose a, any server that like looks, right? There's web servers that look like that. So you figure out one, then even if there's a little bit of traffic in the background, if you do this enough times, you can kind of average out the results, right? So you can use statistics to kind of alleviate the noise. And there's some things where, yeah, so you, and you have clear indicators, right? If the ID increased by more than two, then you know something happened and you should retest, right? So it should be increased either by one or by two. Anything more is garbage and you should ignore. So maybe you could use those as part of like statistics to try to determine if the background noise was consistent, yeah. So you can send, if, if there's some background noise, you can just, can you send a bunch of SYN packets a much greater number to the victim, just so then you'll see that the relay's number is going to increase greatly versus only increasing. Yeah, that would be a, a good way to do it. Yeah, send a bunch. You'd have to change each packet would have to have different source ports, uh, but that shouldn't be a problem. So yeah, you could do like a thousand, send a thousand packets and see if the number. And you could do. You could also pull a, do this connection to the relay to see how its IP change, this IP ID changes over time, so you can get an idea of the baseline exactly and then do this. So maybe you could do this with even more non-idle servers, that would be interesting. But yeah, if you're sending like a thousand packages just to check one SIN, one port is open, that may be a little much, but. Even if, even if the relay is active, does any server keep sending uh, re, uh, reset packets often? It's like if, unless there's a abnormal, uh, traffic into it, will it be uh, sending relay? Uh, 
No, it'll only send a reset packet in response to something it wasn't expecting. Yeah, so we pretty much can't bump them. Uh, oh, but no, it's any packet. So this is the IP header. So any packet that gets sent, right? This is part of the fragmentation, right? IP packets have the that IP datagram ID. So that's the one. So any packets that get sent will alter this value. <laughs> What if it's keeping track what do you mean? So like um, he's out of blue without sending us back at with the Yeah, they're, they're you know, unless they're doing anything special, which if you're choosing a non important server, they're probably not going to be. Right? So yeah, if you look at the traffic, you know, anybody on the relays network would be like, what the heck is going on? Why are we getting all these packets from this victim? Um, and so yeah, that would be super weird. But most people don't look, like how often have you looked inside your network at home to see what weird traffic is being sent? Like never, right? And unfortunately, you, you would expect companies and organizations to be better, but oftentimes they are not. <laughs> yes, front and all that. Yes, different. You're trying to find weak spots in the relay, like, or rather trying to get information about which ports are open in the relay. On the victim, you're trying to figure out which ports are open on the victim by sending the a packet to the victim spoofed as if it's coming from the relay. Okay. So this way, from the victim's perspective, right, all the packets they see coming in are from the relay. Okay. And all the packets they send out are from the relay. So literally, they have no idea what IP address you actually are, which is pretty cool. Yeah? Uh, if the attacker is using a public network, does not having a relay or compromise the identity? Or? If it's using a public network? Uh, so if you're using, what do you mean a public network? Like a public hotspot or something? Yeah, you're, you know, so hypothetically, Speaking, right? Uh, if you'd want to cover your tracks like that, you know, the, if it's like, they could, think about what they could be doing, right? So they could be the public wireless network you're on, could be keeping logs of what Ethernet address is at using the network and what IP address it has, right? And so then when that cop, the public Wi Fi gets, upset because the victim goes, hey, you're port scanning us, they could actually look at that time frame, find that IP address that was making those requests, and figure it out that way. Um, again, that would only give you Ethernet address, right? And so, yeah, you'd have to have other information to track it back to you, but that would be, you know, but can you change or spoof your MAC address? You should all nod your head, you're doing that for your project too, for part two. What? <laughs> So, but you also gotta be worried whenever you're connected to a computer, how much information, I mean, when you're connected to a network, how much information you're leaking, right? It could be leaking, if you have any sharing set up of folders or anything, right? You'll be advertising your computer's name, which may not be a random name, it's probably something you gave it that means something to you. Uh, all that kind of stuff, like, even I think Dropbox, right, has, this land sharing feature, so Dropbox is probably sending out packets to see who else is on there, like a lot of stuff that gets sent out, so. Cool. All right, idle scanning. Okay, so just like we talked about, I guess I went a little bit early. Um, so as we saw, some of these port scanning techniques are based on the fact that operating systems deal with Packets that are unexpected in different ways based on the port is open or closed. OS fingerprinting is the idea that different TCP IP implementations will deal with unexpected packets in different ways. So, and it's actually kind of a crazy idea when you think about it, right? We're just two computers connected to the network, and yet by sending you special packets and seeing how you respond, I can know exactly what operating system you're running. Um, it's pretty cool. 
So some of the things, like what happens when they send a thin TCP packet? Uh, what happens if you have special flags that you put, or that you set the bits on the undefined flags? In some TCP IP stacks, though they're reflected back at you for whatever weird reason, maybe a programming weirdness. Um, what do you send weird combinations of flags, like a push and a spin and a reset and a thin, like the Christmas tree attack? Sometimes the selection of the initial sequence numbers can actually tell you what operating system it is, if it's somehow predictable. Uh, the selection of the TCP window size, so the window size, remember, says, hey, only send me at most this much data. I can't handle more than this. Right? So different operating systems have different defaults for that. Um, when does it send ICMP messages? Right? Does it send... Is there, I think we saw earlier with UDP scanning that the, uh, on Windows it'll send a maximum of five ICMP port not found messages in a second or something like that. So you have to make sure you're not scanning faster than that. So that would be a way to tell if you're scanning a Windows machine versus a Linux machine. Right, because you can send out a bunch of these packets and if they're only replying to a certain amount in a certain time window, you can detect that. When they reply with an ICMP message, sometimes they'll include part of that packet that was invalid in their response. So how much do they send? Uh, what TCP options do they do? Do they include certain flags that are optional or not include certain flags? So what's very cool, and the crazy thing about this, it seems kind of, um, it's, it's, I like to think of this kind of like languages. Right? It's like they're all speaking the language of TCP, IP, UDP, but they all have different dialects. Right? So by probing their dialects, you can try to figure out who exactly is speaking. Um, and the really interesting thing about this, so it kind of makes sense, like, yeah, if I send you packets, I can figure out. But there's also passive ways of doing this. So there's a program called POF which will passively listen to the network traffic that's being sent and can actually try to infer what operating systems the hosts are running. There's also an active way of doing this in NMAP, so you can use NMAP to actively scan uh, machines, which is pretty cool. This is fun to do. You can like play with these things and try to figure out what kind of devices are running. What would also be cool would be to uh, use TCP dump or Wireshark and look at the packets that NMAP is sending when it does these scans. That would also be really interesting. Um, okay. So we talked about handshakes. We talked about the sending data. Now we need to talk about, so we talked about port scanning. So now we need to talk to our favorite networking topic and attack that we've talked about at every level, which is what? Spoofing, spoof packets, right? So at the TCP layer, we want to be able to do what? And we want to basically create a TCP connection with another system while changing the source IP, right? And making it think like it came from a different server. So we want to establish uh, impersonate another host. And it was first described, uh, this is kind of a, linking this back to some of the history we talked about. Uh, RTM, the guy who wrote the Morris form, uh, wrote kind of on a separate thing, not related to the Morris form, but about how to do this, and that you could impersonate and do TCP spoofing. Uh, and it was used by Kevin Mitnick in his attack against the SDSC. So let's look at it. So what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to exploit trust in the system, right? So the idea is the server we're trying to attack doesn't trust me, but it trusts some other host. So I want to make a connection to the server and pretend like it came from that host, right? So node A trusts node B. But we're node C and we want to impersonate node B when we make a connection to node A. 
So how can we do this? What makes this, is this easy? We've done this with UDB, we've done this with every level. Is it easy? Why or why not? Yes, it comes down to the three-way handshake. The three-way handshake is really what makes TCP incredibly difficult to spoof, right? Can we spoof the initial, the source IP of the initial SYN packet? Yeah, but then what happens to that SYN ACK? It goes to whoever we spoofed, right? So, but then, so there's two, there's two things here. One, that server may respond with a reset, right? So that may kill our connection. And what is this server expecting back? The correctly implemented server-side sequence number in an ACK packet, right? So we have SYN, SYN ACK, it's expecting that ACK packet back. So the core problem, the crux of what TCP spoofing comes down to is that we don't see that SYNAC packet. So we have to e either guess what that sequence number was or somehow get that packet. <laughs> so what if we're on the same network as all these systems? The same local network. Yeah, we can sniff everything, right? We talked about all kinds of ways that we can sniff traffic. So there does it become hard or easy? Easy, fairly easy. What do we have to worry about, though? Being discovered? We always have to worry about being discovered. The person responding faster than we do. What was that? The other person responding with an acknowledgement. Yeah, what if that other person responds faster than us, right? So one way we can deal with that is we need to somehow kill that machine. <laughs> right? In whatever way, hypothetically, at a high level, right? We either need to flood it with traffic, crash it, turn it off, and, you know, it doesn't matter. We just want to make sure that machine doesn't respond, right? And we don't have to do this, but, you know, well, we need that reset packet to not be set. That's the key problem here. So to somehow do this, then, we send a TCP SYN segment, right? So we spoof the IP address of the trusted host. A replies with a SYN ACK packet, but it ignores the packet, right? Because it's either dead or it's too busy. So if we're on the same network, we know how to do this, right? We know that we can, uh, we can see that packet, we can sniff that packet on our local network. If we're on a hub, it's trivial. If we're on a switch, maybe we can do some ARP poisoning. But if we can't, right, then because we do not get that response back, so if we can't, we need to send an act back with the server side sequence number plus one. So we either need to see that packet, right? We either need to get that packet or we need to somehow guess the correct sequence number. So this is why this sequence number is the crux of security for TCP, right? So if you just used an incrementing sequence number, right, that's trivially guessable, right? And I don't need to get lucky once, right? I don't need to send one packet with that correct sequence number in that acknowledgement. So, this is how it would look. <coughs> so, we are C, we are the attacker. We will do some kind of denial of service attack, take out this trusted host B. Then, we'll send to A a packet spoofing the source IP, right, of B, to that with our own sequence number here. <laughs> with our own sequence number and no acknowledgement number. A will respond to B with the sequence number, and this is the one we're trying to guess. And then finally, we have to respond with this 54003. Right? And that can tell us what it is. So, this is why, as we said, this is why we talked about choosing the right sequence number. 
So just incrementing the sequence number every couple microseconds is not enough. Yes? True. Won't you still not be able to make a connection? Because won't it still be sending to B? Yeah, it'll still send to B. It'll send, well, it depends on what it's sending. Right, so if you think about SSH, right, which is how we can remotely control a server, what are we sending to the server? After we've logged in. What? Commands, right, like ls new line. And what do we get back? Yeah, the output, but I don't need the output. I'll just add my IP as a trusted host to your system, and then I'll stop doing all this and just SSH into it normally. Right? And then add myself as just a user who can log in. I'll log in as that user, and then I'll probe that system, see if there's any way that I can escalate my privileges that way. Uh, so it depends on exactly what, but yeah, fundamentally you will never get a reply from that server back. You can still always send data to the server, right? Um, but you won't know what it's sending. And you may have to do some weirdness. <coughs> Could you just sniff to get the data that they were sending? Well, if you can sniff it, if you guessed it, then you're not on the network, then you're. What if they reply and you don't know the acknowledgement acknowledge number to send back to them? You just not send acknowledgement? Yeah, you, would not, you wouldn't have to send any acknowledgement because they would just think that all of the packets they sent you got lost, but they would think that all the packets that were coming in were fine. Right? They're getting packets from you, but they can't send any back to you. So it depends on what the application was do. You can always send out packets and just start randomly incrementing that sequence number, right? Like, yeah, yeah, I definitely heard you up to like byte 20, we're good, <laughs> right? And then it would send you a little bit more and go, yeah, yeah, up to 100, we're definitely good. Just keep doing whatever I'm telling you to do, <laughs> right? But it all depends on the specific. But yes, the fundamentals are you will not receive those requests. Yeah. If, if you can't sniff, how do you know that you guessed properly and you got it? Yeah, that's a good question. How would you know? So hopefully you can get it where you only need like one packet you can send as like your exploit packet, which would add you to the system, and then you can test that afterwards. But yeah, you need some way to test, right? Because how would you know if that, once you send a successful packet, they'll be fine with it, right? You send sin, sin act, act, and now you can both send each other data, and if they send you data or something, it's going to be, and you're never getting it. Cool. So this is why it comes down to choosing the right sequence number. So there's an RFC that defines ways to improve sequence number generation and says, hey, we should really use, you know, use something better here. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of implementations didn't do that. And there was a great paper, uh, an early paper called Strange Attractors and TCP IP Sequence Number Analysis, <coughs> where um, this person graphed the IP, the sequence numbers that they were receiving uh, from various OSs. So you can see things like this. This is like Windows 2000 XP, kind of has this hazy cloud. I'd say it's like a decent, you know, decently random, especially when you compare it to something like Windows 95 or 98. <laughs> And the other thing is, right, you get a lot of guesses because you only need one packet that gets that correct. So you can send a bunch of requests back to try these kinds of things. Uh, Linux was pretty good. Um, you can see it spread out. FreeBSD, any you know the history of FreeBSD? So FreeBSD is the distro that like, um, uh, wait, is that OpenBSD? Which one's the security one? FreeBSD, right? Yes, that's what I thought. Yeah, so FreeBSD is their whole thing's about security. So they uh, do code reviews all the time of the code in the kernel, and they're constantly removing stuff that they don't like. Um, it's a very interesting. I think I tried to experiment with it once, but I couldn't like get stuff running. But a lot of uh, actually networking equipment is usually based off of like the BSD family of operating systems. I think part of that has to do with the license. So BSD is anyone can use it, even commercially. Whereas Linux with the GNU license is you can use it, but you have to open source whatever you do. Um, so that's why this is. So it used to be so Cisco. If you know the name of Cisco's operating system on their switches. So they had 
incredibly simple and easy to guess sequence numbers. Okay, think about your switch having this is incredibly bad because why? Because someone could impersonate your switch. Well, connections to the switch would be easy to make. And usually on a switch, you'd have maybe like a trusted IP who could access the, the management interface of your switch. Now if you have an easily guessable sequence number, right, somebody could easily try to guess that and understand that. But they eventually fix it, and now the like, cadence is like very distributed. Mac OS X was pretty good. Uh, HP had, oh, yeah. Uh, what's the X and Y? It's the delta between the packets. So it kind of, sh it's, it's actually three dimensional. It's like X, Y, and Z. Uh, I can't remember all the differences, but the more spread out it is, it means the more difference there is between different sequence numbers. So they just tried a bunch on this, got a bunch of sequence numbers, and plotted the differences there. And so HP's system had a lot of easily recognizable. Unfortunately, they claim they fix it and did not do a really great job. Um, let's see, this one's probably the worst. I don't know if you guys see those dots. There's like 10 dots on this screen. So yeah, this is not a good sequence number. So spoofing. Spoofing is we want to come from a new source. Another type of attack that I don't think we've talked about yet is we may want to hijack a TCP connection. So in this sense, hijacking, instead of starting a new connection, a new conversation, I want to inject data into an already established TCP stream. And if I'm looking at this, I'll spring this class. I hate I, mean, I like continuing so we're done. This is going to take too long. So we'll stop here. We're actually almost at the end of networking. We're going to finish this and then we're going to go on to oh, how about three questions or two minutes? Uh, assignment one questions. <laughs>